So this process is what we've just gone through in the lecture. So we're having a look at the primary and the secondary assessment, or the A through to J that we've just covered. Uh, what I'm going to do is just demonstrate the techniques that I was talking about, how we palpate, how we listen, how we auscultate, where we put the stethoscope, and all of those features. Um, for the purpose of this, I'm just going to assume that I've got personal protective equipment on. So naturally, any trauma patient that comes in, I would always be wearing goggles. I'd have a, have a gloves on, wouldn't I? Yeah? And probably a gown. If it was really bloody and really messy, I might have a mask with a splash shield on it. Uh, so for the purposes of this demonstration, we're just going to assume that I've got all that gear on. Uh, the patient we're going to have is just an unconscious trauma patient. Let's say he was uh, a young man who was ute surfing. You know, does happen. Uh, ute surfing and he's fallen off the ute after doing a bit of circle work in a recently flooded field. Uh, and, uh, and he was found face down. Uh, he's been called, the ambulance were called to the scene of the crash. They've, uh, they've pretty much brought him in. Or actually, let's just say the mates brought him in on the back of the, back of the, the ute. So he's had really no first aid. He's arrived, he's unconscious and uh, or apparently unconscious, but he seems to be breathing. My first step is A for airway. Being aware that he may have a spinal injury, I really want to be mindful that I'm not going to do a head tilt or move his head in any way. So I'd hold his head nice and firmly, and I would use a jaw thrust technique to lift his jaw up and then open his mouth, and I'd be inspecting in the oral cavity for that wet and sloppy, hard and chunky, soft and fleshy. If I saw some blood or some secretions or foreign objects in there, then I might, uh, I might reach back and, and grab my, my Goodell's, not my Goodell's, what do you call it? My, yeah. my Yanker sucker, and I might give it a little suction. So I'd be suctioning out that oropharynx just as far as I can see. If he was still unconscious and didn't make any attempt to gag or to chew on the suction, then it would be reasonable for me to assume that he could probably tolerate a Goodell's airway. So with no gag reflex, putting a Goodell's in, we would size that appropriately on the side of his face there, measuring from the corner of his mouth to his earlobe, and we'd place that in, in whatever technique we were taught. Yeah? His airway is now looked after. The next thing I want to have a look at is breathing. So I'm looking at effectiveness of his breathing. Has he got rise and fall? Does he have symmetry? What is his rate? I want to have a look at his skin colour. Pink is good, blue is bad. So what's his skin colour doing? I'm looking at whether he's using any accessory muscles, his general chest wall integrity. Is there any knives poking out of it or obvious signs of trauma there? I'd have a look at his jugular veins and see that his jugular veins aren't bulging and distended. I'd feel his trachea and make sure his trachea was lying in the middle of his throat and not displaced to one side as it would be if we were in a late sign of a tension pneumothorax. Grabbing the stethoscope, I want to have a listen and I'm going to listen in the second intercostal space, left and right, or right and left. And again in the sixth intercostal space, fifth and sixth intercostal space, again right to left. Assessing whether I've got normal, equal, clear air entry. Let's assume that this man is breathing effectively. I don't have to bag him. If I had to bag him, of course I'd grab a bag valve mask and I would, I would ventilate him. But let's assume that he is breathing. So all trauma patients get a non-rebreather, don't they? The non-rebreather with the reservoir bag filled and we run this at 15 litres per minute. So we're going to place that onto the patient's face. We of course would um, you know, pull that up and make sure it's a well-fitting mask. And that gives up to 90% you know, oxygen. 70 to 90% oxygen with a well-fitting um, face mask. We then move on to C for circulation. C for circulation is looking at whether the patient has circulation, so I'm going to feel for their carotid pulse. It's good to feel the carotid pulse on the opposite side of the patient's body to that which is standing. Feel the carotid pulse and the radial pulse. I want to make sure that I've got both. If he's got a radial pulse, he's probably still perfusing his kidneys. If he's only got a carotid pulse, he's just alive, but not really perfusing much. I also want to have a feel of his skin indicators to see if he's pale, cool or clammy. And I want to have a quick check to make sure that he's not got any uncontrolled external bleeding. So maybe just a quick look to make sure he's not spurting out anywhere. All trauma patients in circulation get two large IV cannula, 14 or 16 gauge cannula. And we would always hang normal saline. So we would cannulate the patient in the antecubital fossa on both sides and we'd hang normal saline. 
If we didn't have a doctor's order as to what IV fluid to put up on our trauma patient, let's say the doctor hasn't arrived yet, but they're on the way, you know, their arrival of the doctor is imminent, normal saline, always normal saline. We would run it only 100 to 200 mils as a step dose without having a doctor's order just to let it free flow. Normal saline. A, B, C is done. The next part of the primary assessment is D for the dysfunction or the disability and we're looking at neurological function. I want to know if he's awake. George, can you hear me? George, open your eyes. He doesn't respond to me A, alert. He doesn't respond to me V, my voice. So I'm going to inflict pain on him. I'll pinch his trapezius or if he has no obvious head or facial trauma, I might put some pressure on his supraorbital rim. If he flinches to pain, he scores a P for pain, doesn't he? If he doesn't flinch or he doesn't have any response to pain, he scores a U, he's unresponsive. And if I hadn't already, if they're a P or a U, they're in the poo, if I hadn't already, I should have put a, 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 an oropharyngeal airway in him. And we have done for this patient. Remember, any patient that's a P or a U really should be intubated. This is just a to buy us time. E stands for expose the patient, not before I check pupils. Checking the pupils is part of our D for disability. So we would check the patient's pupils. We're expecting a consensual response. We expect that the, the torch will cause the pupil to constrict, both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, irrespective of which eye I shine the torch into. We move then down onto exposure. So I would cut his clothing off. I'd remove all of his clothing. But we need to be mindful in removing the clothing that he could get very cold. We should rug him up. So warm blankets, warmed intravenous fluids. If we're giving large volumes of intravenous fluids are required. We might put a space blanket on, remembering that the silver side of the space blanket touches the patient's skin. And then the blankets go over the top of it. We might use a bear hugger. We might use warm overhead lights, some, something to keep the patient warm. We're up to F, and F is the toys, isn't it? So the first part of F, F-I-V-E, we remember it as F-I-V-E. So the first part of F is the family presence. So I might get somebody to go and get his, uh, his, his family to come in, or his friends to come in, to be with him, if they should choose to do so. I stands for insert. So the things we're inserting into our trauma patients, routinely we'll put an indwelling catheter in a patient. So your role might be to either insert that or to set up for it, an indwelling catheter. Providing there's no uh, disintegrity at the urethral meatus, no bleeding from the penis in this patient, then putting in an IDC would be a reasonable thing to do. We also should consider putting a gastric tube in. We put a gastric tube in to keep the stomach empty. We can test the gastric contents for any blood, just like we can test the urine for blood, we can test gastric contents for any blood, indicating some gastric trauma. But either a nasogastric or an orogastric tube could be inserted. Again, whether we insert that or whether the doctor inserts it when he intubates the patient or she intubates the patient is irrelevant. The fact is this tube needs to go in and somebody should be putting it in or setting up for it at the very least. I, V, V is the vital signs. I want to take all of the vital signs. I might compute a Glasgow Coma score, that 3 to 15 score. I might do a full set of vital signs on him, blood pressure, temperature, pulse, respirations. I might also do colour warmth movement sensation if he had limb injuries. I might look at those uh, focused observations. And uh, E stands for the electrical toys. We're always going to put a cardiac monitor on a trauma patient, aren't we? Always monitor the patient. We would always put pulse oximetry. And I don't have pulse oximetry here on the table with me, but we would always put a pulse oximeter on the patient. And that's something that we all, 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 